project from the diaphragm. <laughs> I think we're taking the top. My name is Joseph Carricker. Uh, I am the developer for the Blue Rose RPG. Hi, I'm Crystal Frazier. I'm the developer on the Mutants and Masterminds line and do bits and pieces of writing for, for many other products that Green Ronin puts out. Sorry, Green Ronin. I have to say it right if I'm going to be on a panel. Special being recorded. Oh, yes. <laughs> My name is Malcolm Shepard, and I'm the developer for the Modern Age game line and for Orc. Um, my official title is developer at large, which is both a pun on my height and the fact that uh, if something needs to be done, I kind of do whatever extra scribbling or whatever needs to be done. Um, because all the rest of us are locked solely into one line <laughs> and well, don't develop <laughs> games for other lines. <laughs> yeah, but I had mine put on my card. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, we all work on each other's stuff, and yep. that's one of the nice things um, is that uh, the development teams are pretty are pretty good with exchanging ideas. And um, the only exception is that I'm terrible at supers games, uh, so I haven't done anything for you in the last So. Well, just do a dimension hopping adventure, and you yeah. can pretend it's threefold. I can pretend. Well, no, it's more the it's more. It's more the systems side of it. I need to really dig into it a little more. I've always felt a little insecure now that we're burying our, our hearts. I was like, oh. Okay. I felt a little insecure about Fine, Super's okay. games ever since I picked up Champions. Oh, oh. When I was 15. <laughs> <laughs> My father never loved me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Pramus! Star of Tabletop! My first name is actually Christian. Interesting. Huh, interesting. Ironic. We're learning. Turns out there's another room called the Bash in Union Station. Oh, really? Oh, no. Oh, man. So. I told you here in the convention center. Yeah, well, I couldn't find it. Did you, did you ask someone for directions? Oh, see, now, now it's how. So I made mistakes. That's <laughs> okay, mistakes were made. We're trying to get past them. Okay. <laughs> I feel like there should be a banquet. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was talking about serenading people. Yeah, nice. Uh, so we're going to talk about new hotnesses. Um, I brought things to show. So I even thought it hit. Yes. Yay! Um, since three of our five new things are mutants and masterminds, um, I'm going to kick it to Crystal um, to talk about them. Would my lovely assistant hold them up as I talk about them? Absolutely. All right, so for mutants and masterminds, we've had the Super Team Handbook, which is sort of a stealth player companion slash campaign guide for nine different power levels of campaigns. Or no, eight different power levels? And it was a stealth way of showing GMs how to run your campaign based on all of our favorite comic books. So there's a Justice League analog, there's a Suicide Squad analog, there's a Leverage analog, there's a Ninja Turtles analog, all teaching you how to run a Mutants and Masterminds game in that style with a pre-built team so you can just pick up this book. You don't even need like character creation sessions. You can just hand out pre-made characters. They're ready to go and just have an adventure. And in addition to that, the first half of the book is all, this is like how you build a character with a whole team in mind. Here are feats that, or here are advantages that help out other members of your team and how, and here are powers that do that. Like here's how you develop a heroic identity that is unique and doesn't step on everybody else's toes because we're all trying to shine at the same time. So. I've not seen a lot of books in my years developing RPGs that are all about, here's how you function as a healthy group for this healthy group activity. <laughs> <laughs> healthy? Whoa. Well, healthy Yeah. And there's a, there's a little section in the front about how to not be an asshole, which <laughs> I had to learn the hard way, and I thought everybody would appreciate my insights. <laughs> uh, 
So next up is the Deluxe Game Master's Guide, which is our previous Game Master's Guide for Mutants and Masterminds, revised and expanded and put in a hardback so it'll stand up to tableware a lot better. Uh, it includes new villain archetypes and new minions. It's got a little section saying, if you're coming from the basic Heroes Handbook, which we released last Gen Con, here's what you need to know to make use of this. So it tells you the very quick and dirty functional rules for a bunch of the powers that weren't in the basic Heroes Handbook. Uh, it includes a whole new chapter on building adventures and then two sample adventures in the back. So Power Play by Liz Liddell and The Isle of Dr. Circe by Steve Kenson. Z. Z. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, yes, who is a featured speaker? What do we call them now at Gen Con? Uh, industry Insights. Uh, Our indus uh, st industry insider, Steve Kenson. Yes. Uh, and finally, we have a our very first ever novel for Mutants and Masterminds, Height of the Storm, which is set during the Silver Storm in Emerald City. If you played through our adventure path uh, in the back of the Emerald City setting, our campaign setting book, you're already familiar with that, but it's about a, a young woman who picks up her grandfather's heroic legacy and tries to save the city that it, as it's going, kind of falling apart around everybody's ears. And that's, that's what came out for Gen Con for me and Masterminds. Thank you. I'm going to kick it over to... Malcolm. Malcolm. Really, I thought I could rest longer since you have three-fifths of the new stuff, but all right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I talk fast, I'm nervous. <laughs> all right, so, um, as I said before, I'm the Modern Age developer, and we are... Uh, producing more books, and as you may or may not know, Modern Age has uh, no inbuilt setting. However, I did want a flagship setting, and here it is. It's called Threefold. Um, now, uh, you know, some of you may like something like John Wick, some of you may like Harry Potter, but wouldn't it be great if they could team up and fight a robot? <laughs> Your answer is less important than mine, which is that, yes, indeed, it would be awesome. Um, so the idea for Threefold is I wanted uh, a setting that could accommodate every possible option that you'd come up with in modern age and add some more. So, um, and I also wanted it to be relatable and have a relatable form of fantasy, which we do through portal fantasy. So the uh, premise of Threefold is that there are many gates connecting Earth to other universes, and these gates are stable. They're hard to create, destroy, or change. So that gives rise to factions and even entire empires that sprawl across hundreds or even thousands of planes. Um, the planes are divided into three basic types, which is one, one of the things Threefold references. So on the top, we have our iconic Zatra Thul um, in a plane called the Netherworld, which is a L-type plane. They're the best plane. Uh, Zatra <laughs> is a Dragur, uh, which is a variety of human um, that is adapted to live in netherworldly conditions. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes under the yoke of a demonic master, and sometimes uh, freed a member of a group called the Night Host, who freed themselves from their masters and now ravage through the plains uh, to maintain their freedom, um, you know, and to get stuff. <laughs> um, in the middle, we have a representation of Earth. Um, you know, Earth is almost like the Earth we know. Um, except that technology is capable of greater things um, than we're normally aware of. There is a secret organization called Aethon, which includes post-human operatives that protect Earth from being interfered with by other planes. Those planes include alternate Earths, and sometimes include alternate instances of that their own organization. Um, so I kind of wanted to do a, you know, I guess it would be like a fringe ghost in the shell person of interest mashup. Um, and then at the bottom we have our longtime modern age iconic Sean, who is holding up the badge of the Sodality, um, which is a benevolent organization. Kind of think of, of Starfleet crossed with the Aurors from Harry Potter. Um, they travel the planes, they do good stuff, and Sean is in an other world, a plane uh, that is magically active um, with, you know, all the stuff you might expect, monsters, uh, annoying demigods, um, and, uh, you know, 
castles and stuff. <laughs> um, so the idea is that you can take one of these slivers of the setting and explore it greatly and just have fun with it, or you can eat the whole sandwich, uh, or I like as, sandwiches. <laughs> as Chris likes to put it, fully loaded nachos, <laughs> um, you know, and traverse plane to plane. We initially introduced uh, Threefold uh, on Free RPG Day, um, so we had a quick start that introduced the universe, so this is the full treatment. And this is, we're going to do other settings for Modern Age, but this is the one that we're, you know, we'll return to and continue to expand. Um, and we will kind of have a mind to have some future things remain compatible with it. For example, uh, later on this year we're going to be doing Enemies and Allies, which is uh, sort of the counterpart to the bestiary for Fantasy Age, but it's a collection of non-player characters and creatures um, and, you know, entities that one might encounter. And all of them are canonical within Threefold. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's the return to big setting, you know, that lasts forever and ever um, until it collapses under its own weight and is purchased by a Swedish company for change. Um, but uh, we don't have that plan for another 20 years. That could never happen in real life. Never speak to me and my shadow runners again. Um, so I'm, I'm quite excited about, about that and about the opportunity to share it and, uh, and see how people move forward with it. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, so the last of our new releases here at Gen Con is the Fantasy Age Campaign Builder's Guide. Um, and this is uh, basically like a GM's book for Fantasy Age. Um, and it is a, just a lot of advice uh, on how to build and, and maintain a campaign in the game. So, it's got all sorts of stuff from, you know, story hooks to, um, you know, get, how to handle your group, um, and uh, blah. <laughs> selling it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's got some treatments, uh, narrative treatments of organizations, yeah. uh, right? And not just big organizations, things like businesses, right? Um, things that you encounter in a city or, uh, you know, or you know what uh, the background business that doesn't seem like a big deal in a setting until someone tries to go buy a hat, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then, then you find out because yeah. you made beaver skin hats available, yeah. they can build yeah, a. Yeah, there's about thirty plant. pages of hats in the book. Yeah. To be honest, <laughs> we may have overdone it there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you put in spats like I asked? <laughs> New printing. Oh, That's it. <laughs> So yeah, so say if you're going to run a campaign, it's just a lot of useful advice on how to really do that. So you know, there's a chapter on on you know how do you handle religion in the game, and if you want to create a pantheon, and uh, there's relationship rules and all kinds of stuff. So if you are running a fantasy edge campaign, it is a good book for you. It's a lot of advice. There are some some practical rule support uh, bits as well. So it's a handy book. Um, so. Uh, that covers the new stuff we have here at the show. Um, so why don't we start talking about what we have coming up in the near future. Joe, yes. we haven't tapped your magnificence yet, so... <laughs> uh, would you like to talk about Blue Rose? Absolutely. Uh, so here in the future, um, our very next uh, product release is a, a large-scale campaign. Um, called Envoys to the Mountain, where the player characters play members, uh, they play agents of the Sovereign's Finest, um, and kind of get wrapped up in uh, a really long-running plot that actually takes them all the way from, uh, the, we basically included a chapter for sort of each of the tiers of age play. So it's going to take them all the way from very early levels to very, very high levels. Um, the campaign is written so that it spans about five years of game time uh, and includes sections sort of in between chapters that give some advice on uh, 
that give some advice on you know what to do during those those periods of downtime sorts of side side adventures including referencing some of our other like adventure anthologies and and you know solo adventures and things as good places to sort of drop them into the middle of what all's going on or just kind of gives the narrator uh, guidance for you know skipping giving a little hand waving we do some montages and we're off and running um, and um, uh, in order to strike kind of a, a balance between like well this is a campaign that in theory anybody is supposed to be able to play versus in my experience the very best campaigns are kind of those that are sort of written for the characters and like how do you strike that with this sort of thing um, we've introduced a concept called hooks so player characters at the beginning of the campaign sit down and look through short descriptions of hooks that kind of describe how their characters are hooked into the campaign. Um, and they get a short summary, enough to let them make a choice, and then they get some extra little mechanics that are attached to it, and some little background elements that are not the whole of their background, but that the player is encouraged to sort of fold into whatever else they're creating, so that you will have things like, you know, rival, rival characters from a one character's background crop up as being part of the main plot and that sort of thing. Um, after uh, Envoys to the Mount, we have a book called uh, Touching the Wild. Um, and Touching the Wild is sort of a split book. It does two things. One of the things that it does is it's a, a bestiary of Shadow Spawn um, uh, for the setting of Blue Rose. So it's all about the, a variety of sort of you know, animal level and sort of monster level creatures that have been touched by shadow, many of them which have their origins in normal natural environments, but that shadow uh, has, has altered them in some way. The other half of the book is, uh, is a write-in player's guide, so it's a, 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 a whole half of the book that expands the psychic sapient animal player characters of the, uh, of the Blue Rose line. Um, and kind of gives uh, some, explores a little like what the backgrounds of Raiden Awakenings are, how they form culture, um, how they interact with sort of uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the culture and society of non Raiden, um, as well as gives some fun player focused mechanics like extra talents and specializations and arcana and that sort of thing. Um, that book also includes a chapter. Uh, that book also includes a chapter uh, that is, acts as a gazetteer for the plains of Rizia, um, which are of course home to, uh, to, nomadic, uh, to nomadic sort of horse lord tribes. Uh, because Rizia in particular is shaped by the kind of clash between the shadow spawn that dwell in the really dangerous places of Rizia and the rye horses and other Raiden that are at the, at the center of their various nomadic bands. Um, and then uh, finally after that we have a, uh, we released a number of, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, our uh, adventure anthology Six of Swords. Um, so we are releasing another adventure anthology, this one is called Six of Cups. Uh, and again, it is six adventures. These are explicitly taking place in the nation of Aldis, in various places that we haven't really explored a whole lot so far in the game line, and include, uh, include several page gazetteers that sort of describe either specific cities, regions, uh, you know, around a, around a decent sized town, or even large like, you know, a mountain valley or something of this sort. So they're kind of a, a way for us to explore a little more of that kingdom in a very hands-on, like, here's this thing, and now here's an adventure that uses it, sort of way. Thank you, Joe. Um, so, as you probably know, we published the Expanse uh, role-playing game this year. Uh, came out in June, um, and that is going to be a, a continuing line of, uh, of game products of its own. Uh, it also uses the adventure game engine, uh, which if you've played Blue Rose or Fantasy Age or Modern Age, uh, you already know the, the basics of the game and how to play, but it's our first uh, science fiction iteration of the age system, so you know, lets us play with spaceships and, uh, and fun things like that. Um, so, the, right now the core rulebook is out, um, and the Game Master's Kit, uh, which is a hardback GM screen, 
uh, some reference cards for stunts and things like that, and then uh, a short adventure. Um, and then before Christmas, hopefully, uh, we are going to have Abzu's Bounty, which is the first um, full-length campaign for the game. Uh, so that has been written and is moving into production now. Uh, it basically is a campaign in a book. So um, if you are looking for something to do uh, for the Expanse, uh, it'll be from a ready-made space fun for you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then one of the things we did with the Expanse, because it's obviously a big story with a lot of parts, and unlike some novel series, it really doesn't shy away from enormous staggering change in the status quo of the story. Uh, when you get to certain novels, you're like, holy shit, <laughs> those maniacs, they blew it up. Uh, so, um, <laughs> spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't say what it was. Uh, so, the core game is set between the events of the first novel and the second novel. Uh, so, basically, like the proto molecule is known to exist, but exactly like what it's up to is still mysterious. Um, and so, as we move forward with the line, um, we will then be doing books that, uh, that move the timeline forward be like, okay, well, now that the events of book three have happened, what are the implications of that for campaign play and so on? Um, and I, I don't know, like I said, I don't want to do spoilers too much, but there are some major ones. Um, and, uh, and many of them lead to different, um, you know, flavors of campaign. So, you know, there's a major event that very much is like, oh, now you can get in a spaceship and go explore, you know, so that'll be a type of campaign. And then, there will be another one that will be like, oh, now everything's gone to hell, and you're living in a post-apocalyptic hellscape, so that's so, uh, so. Uh, so that's sort of the plan moving forward. Um, and then uh, after Abzu's Bounty, um, we were doing a book called Ships of the Expanse, because it's a science fiction setting, so gotta have a book about spaceships. Um, in the Kickstarter for the game, some of the stretch goals were for uh, deck plans for various types of ships. So basically, um, the Kickstarter backers will get those deck plans uh, you know, as promised, but they will be incorporated into the larger Ships of the Expanse book, um, which will then feature you know, all sorts of additional uh, ships and deck plans and uh, probably um, some expanded rules for uh, spaceship combat and, uh, and things like that. Um, so that is our basic plan going forward with the expanse. Um, Crystal, do you want to talk about more eminent books that you come? Sure. Uh, so one of the big things everybody's been asking us for for third edition mutants and masterminds is when do we get more adventures? And so the Deluxe Game Master's Guide includes two adventures, and we've also started work on a line of PDF adventures called Astonishing Adventures, uh, which we've used as the title for other adventure sections for pre-existing books, and it sounds neat, so we're running with it. So once we get the art squared away for the first one, The Reign of Cats and Dogs, that will be out, and that is a like, slightly fun, tongue-in-cheek, like, romp through Emerald City as every animal in the city gains superpowers. <laughs> did you write that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's a con adventure I ran here a couple of years ago, actually. Uh, so, that line will be happening soon because it's a PDF. It's a little more, like, in the air and tends to be the thing that gets pushed back, so... But I need to follow up with, I need to follow up on the art, and then we'll get that out to people finally. Uh, but the next big print book we've got coming out from Mutants and Masterminds that is in production right now is the Time Traveler's Codex. So, yeah, we have we have found a way to use some of the material from the second edition Age of books, but most of this book is a big description of here's how you use time travel in your superheroes game because it is a super common element in comics and because I personally really love time travel. Uh, so we've, we've pulled a lot of, like, figure out what time travel means and how it works and that'll shape, like, if your time travel only works by, like, finding natural gates and jumping, that's awesome. Here's how it affects your campaign. If you can only time travel with 
you tricked out high-tech sports cars, this is how you use that in your campaign. If your time travel works by having a GM level NPC that shunts your PCs around through the time stream, this is how it works. Uh, it includes the advice that you should not give your PCs a time machine unless you want time travel to solve all their problems. <laughs> it includes, of course, a bunch of hero archetypes that are based on time travel, and I'm not saying I pulled heavily from the X-Men, but I pulled pretty heavily from X-Men. Uh, it's got a bunch of time travel-oriented villains, and I'm not saying I pulled heavily from the Time Lords of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but... <laughs> Um, and then a good-sized chunk of the book is just very short gazetteers for different historical periods that you see come up in uh, comic books a lot. So your Imperial Rome, your Wild West, your uh, Ming Empire China, and in addition to like here's some minions and here's what's going on, there's also some sections on like, well what if I just want to run a historical superheroes game? What do superheroes in this era slash setting look like? So, Perfect. yeah, I, I really like giving people advice on how to run campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Mutant Ninja Turtles. And, God, yes. <laughs> hey, hey, I've got a great idea for a license we should get, Chris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what could it be? <laughs> Uh, it's biker mice from Mars. <laughs> uh, is there more you want to say about modern age, Malcolm? Or do you feel like yes. yes. Um, first of all, I will talk about upcoming things by going back because one of the things uh, it's kind of been a whirlwind. Um, <laughs> but we had the modern age companion come out, and that actually dropped at Origins. Um, so, you know, so only about a month ago. And the Companion has all kinds of expanded rules to further customize your Modern Age game. So you, uh, you may or may not be familiar with Modern Age, but Modern Age has a whole bunch of built-in tools um, to specify how the rules work depending on the genre. And this expands that so um, you know, if you want to play an embodied artificial intelligence or an elf uh, or things like that, uh, non-humans, um, or a different kind of human, the systems are in the companion. If you want, uh, you know, martial arts duels, fighting styles, um, if you want characters to be able to uh, expand their talents beyond mastery, um, if you want uh, to control uh, how characters succeed according to sort of the dramatic rhythm of the game, um, we have something, well, uh, it's kind of interesting because there's a mechanic in the expanse called the churn. Um, and the funny thing is that the churn was sort of in its beta mode, and then I stole it for the uh, <laughs> companion, and I tweaked it. And then when the churn was being finalized, Steve stole it back from me. <laughs> but we also have serendipity, which is the flip side of the churn. So when people are keep failing, you can kind of give them an out after a while. Um, you know all kinds of tools um, to really make make it conform to the genre and setting that you want, right? And that's out now. Um, and, you know, moving forward, um, we're going to have a PDF adventure to, you know, that's designed to be a first adventure uh, called Warflower. And uh, if any of you played uh, Modern Age, at Gen Con before, you may have played a previous version of Warflower, right? Uh, where, you know, fresh characters dealing with the machinations of, uh, of a wealthy industrialist, uh, occultist swordswoman um, who, like likes, who yeah. likes old, old books. Um, and, uh, you know, moving on from that, going, you know, further into the future. Um, for Threefold, we're doing an adventure book called Five and Infinity, um, and it's so-called because there are five adventures going through the, uh, you know, various level groupings of age, so, you know, from low to high levels, with kind of doubling up on low levels because we want lots of resources for people starting out uh, with Threefold, and also something called the Infinity Engine, which is a way to generate adventures using a series of tables uh, to generate adventure books uh, and basic outlines. Um, so the idea is that not only do you have this series of adventures, but you have a method to sort of extemporize and create your own adventures in threefold, ongoing. Uh, for modern age core stuff, uh, 
The uh, next book we're working on is the uh, Modern Age Mastery Guide. And the Mastery Guide is, uh, in some ways, it's a counterpart to the Fantasy Age Companion, although it's a little more system intensive. Um, and it is player facing as well as game master facing. So it's, it's how to play the game well, um, both through, you know, abstract advice that apply to any RPG and also advice that specifically matters to age, right? Um, for example, you know, what stunts are for, um, you know, how to sort of explore your character's niche and do well with it. Um, going up for, you know, game master tools to uh, plan your campaign, um, to have specific types of character organization. So, for example, you have, um, you know, we have the default character party, right? Which is, you know, a bunch of people who know each other and get into trouble, right? Um, but of course, you know, you have the classic game Ars Magica, which, uh, which had the troop uh, form of organization where there's one central character. Um, and that central character may change from adventure to adventure. Um, and then we have things like uh, Cast of Thousands play, uh, where the main thing is an epic sweep of events, um, and your characters may change depending on the aspect of it you wish to explore, right? Um, so, you know, if, uh, if you're running a game, a post-apocalyptic game, where uh, a big thing strikes the Earth, right? you can play a hardy group of, of survivors with no special skills except what they can uh, you know, learn after feasting on charred rats um, you know, up to you know, um, a special operations group that's been left behind. Right? That's dealing with the collapsing political situation. Uh, I really love uh, varying the assumptions of play in role-playing games and I think Modern age, because of its innate flexibility, is good for that. So the mastery guide is going to get into that in a big way. However, moving back, I'm really doing this out of order, and it's terrible. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the very next thing that is coming out uh, is enemies and, and allies, uh, as I talked about uh, before, right? And that's all compatible with threefold, but you don't need threefold for it. It also works as a general resource. So Enemies and Allies um, is a collection of non-player characters, creatures, and things um, that are organized by that are organized by genre. So we have a section uh, that is devoted exclusively to you know specialists, you know the people you know our top men, right? That kind of thing, right? So your special forces operators and your um, you know your hackers. Uh, and your MMA fighters. So we have examples of those, right? And then we have, you know, the crime and punishment section, which is, you know, a bunch of different kinds of criminals and people associated with them. Uh, and then we have a horror-oriented chapter, and we have an urban effect, social things and stunts. Um, and you have a sim you have similar ones for each of those sections. Um, to represent technology-focused games or games where you know making moral decisions is important, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to have a seamless experience, always as if you're playing a game that was designed especially for that genre and that situation you're in. And that's sort of the goal of, of, of modern age as a whole, right? Uh, not to be a generic game, um, but to be the perfect game uh, for what you want. Um, all you do is you apply the tools that we that we provide. Um, one further thing to mention about Modern Age, um, we put out uh, this year, last year, uh, this year, <laughs> um, the World of Lazarus. That was the first setting for the game. Yes. Um, it was a, a world book uh, based on the Lazarus comic by uh, Greg Rucka, uh, which is a very cool uh, dystopian near future setting. Um, and um, uh, it was, for us, just a single shot book, but there is um, support for it actually in the comic itself. So Crystal has been writing articles um, that are appearing in the back of the current issues of the comic. So if you like the World of Lazarus uh, book and you want some more material for it, um, you can go right to the comic and there, there's new stuff. And I highly recommend the comic because it is a ton of 
Well, fun is the wrong word for it. It's a very that. good comic <laughs> about a very terrible world with very bad people in it. <laughs> what, you wouldn't say lighthearted romp would work? No, no. Uh, more of a heavy hearted stomp? Yeah. <laughs> but it's very A well hard hearted worked. stomp. Yeah. It's got very endearing characters who occasionally do horrible things. Yeah, basically, it's, it's a near future setting um, where the nation states have sorted sort of faded and the world has been taken over by these powerful families. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, the mafia takes over the world. <laughs> um, and it's a world of, of uh, even more massive income inequality than we have today uh, and, um, and uh, with a lot of scarcity issues. So, you know, there's a whole category of people who are just called waste because really they're superfluous to the family's requirements and they're just kind of left on their own to figure shit out. Uh, yeah, it is basically half cyberpunk dystopia, half post-apocalyptic. Yeah. And it's, the game itself has a bunch of new professions and backgrounds, uh, lots of new talents that cover things like sword fighting and demolitions and uh, having cybernetics or genetic modifications new specializations, some of which ended up making it into uh, the modern companion. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, Greg Rucka, is, uh, he's an old school gamer, and so you know, he was really <clears throat> geeked to be able to have an RPG book you know, based on his work. And, we were geeked to get to work with Rico, so, you know, it's a win-win. I was just excited that other people had read Lazarus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention is um, um, those of you who have uh, been supporting us for a long time, uh, actually next year is our 20th anniversary as a company, so it's going to be exciting. Um, you may recall, in our early years, we did a lot of third-party support for D&D. So, you know, that was what was called the D20 era, um, and we did a lot of, of books at that time. So in 2001, I wrote a book called Legions of Hell, which was a bestiary for devils. Um, we then followed it up uh, with a book called Armies of the Abyss um, that Eric Mona, now of Plaza Publishing, wrote. Um, and did the same for demons. And then later, we combined them up um, <coughs> and had a th added a third section about demons um, and uh, put that into a book called The Book of Fiends. And that was one of our most popular and well-received uh, books of the D20 years, just a, a giant um, you know, uh, bestiary of, of infernal critters. So um, we're going to bring that back for fifth edition. Um, and we hired really the only correct person to put that together, who is Rob Schwab, uh, designer of Shadow of the Demon Lord, and uh, Rob worked for us uh, before he struck out on his own for many years, um, and he developed the original Book of Fiends, so it was kind of a, a return to for him. So if you know Rob, you know that he is, you know, no one does evil better than Rob. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's as evil as Rob. Yeah, it's really exactly in his wheelhouse. Uh, so he's um, you know, converted the old material to 5th edition um, and then added a bunch of new, uh, even more evil monsters. Um, and the original book was uh, black and white. This would be glorious color. Um, so uh, we're going to be crowdfunding that uh, probably in the fall possibly early next year, depending on a few things. But uh, uh, Rob has designed it, and evil stands ready. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what am I forgetting? Uh, You've got the thing to announce. Yes, there's, yes, a thing. there's a there's thing. A thing. Um, <laughs> we, there's... Are we going any further on the Mutants and Masterminds announcements? Oh, OK. Uh, the next one after the Time Travel Codex, which we're outlining right now, is the Vigilante's Handbook. Because we started out with a uh, low-powered student for high school, eh, high school heroes, and from there ramped up to cosmic level heroes, and now we are taking it back down to lower power levels, but with less hijinks and more brooding on rooftops. And <laughs> so we are putting together the book of 
how you kick butt when you are not in a shiny tower and you don't have the commissioner on speed dial and all you have is a crowbar and a will to change the world. Shut up, Excellent. All right. Um, I'm excited about that one. I, uh, there's, um, I got a couple of more. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so last year we came up with Orc Second Edition, um, really the best game um, in the Green Ronin catalog. Um, it's, it's got red on the cover, so it goes faster. It yeah. goes faster, but uh, uh, we have sort of ready to go um, uh, Game Master Resource or Orc Master Resource, uh, the Orc Master Mayhem Kit. Um, and that includes new adventures um, and some reference material. And uh, uh, um, I can't, I can't promise it, but I'm also hoping for a paper doll dealy where you can dress your own orc. <laughs> um, so I'm excited about that. But uh, when I was working on orc, uh, the system we came up with was, was really nice. Um, you know, I had the advantage of uh, of working with you know. Um, Stuff that Chris had done to initially de develop it, and uh, John Lethauser who does the work on it. So I was really sort of doing the end polish. But what came out of it was something that's like, you know, I want to do a serious game with this. So I pitched it. Um, so that game is uh, is sort of going to be on target sometime next year. It's called Swords of the Shadow Planet, um, and it is an up sort of an updated take on planetary romance. Um, you know, using both our current understanding of science um, and our current understanding of not being offensive. Um, so, you know, think of you know John Carter, but without the asides on the virtues of Southern gentlemen, um, and and you kind of get a sense of it. Less colonialism. Uh, less colonialism. So, you know, uh, the titular shadow planet is uh, is an artificial structure uh, hidden in the Kuiper Belt. Um, and uh, it is this, you know, sort of hollow world inside which um, every thousand years, whatever controls it, snatches uh, people and creatures from Earth, right? So you will have, uh, you have an empire that's, uh, that believe that they are the kingdom of Prester John, right? The legendary Asian uh, em medieval emperor, right? Um, except that they think their Prester John will come out of this alien tomb that they found, right? Or you have these Mithraists who were snatched a thousand years before that, uh, who are trying to get closer to the sun in their flying cars. Um, you know, you have evolved dinosaurs, uh, Neanderthals with, uh, with you know, uh, specially bred enormous uh, siege bears, all right? And just, just fun stuff for, you know, sword play and ray guns um, and casual, a casual kind of game where you can swashbuckle, learn the rules quickly, make a character quickly. And organizationally, I think it's going to follow work where it's going to have everything you need, including a series of adventures right in the book, right? So you get it, you run it, and you're good. Cool. Um, well, so now we're going to make an announcement. <laughs> uh, at 5 o'clock on our website, we're putting up a press release, but since you're here, you get to hear about it first. Um, if any of you read The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison, um, that is the first of a trilogy called the Broken Earth Trilogy, and each book of the trilogy won a Hugo Award, which has never happened before. Uh, really excellent novels, and we have licensed them. Uh, and we're going to be doing a fifth season role playing game. So that will be coming out next year. Um, and Joe here is going to co-develop it um, with Tanya DePass. Uh, is there anything you want to say about it at this juncture? Um, not a whole lot, other than uh, other than we, you know, feel like there's some sort of inherent drama uh, built into that setting that uh, we feel like has the potential to make for good games. Um, uh, you know, including one of those conflicts being, uh, you know, the traditional conflicts of, of narrative, one of those being man versus the environment. Really, the, bro the, the Broken Earth series really cranks that all the way up. Um, and uh, 
Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to be using the uh, Chronicle system, uh, which was last seen as the engine that we use for Song of Ice and Fire role playing. Um, specifically because one of the, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the fifth season, one of the big aspects of the setting is uh, the development of communities or comms. Um, and so we're basically going to take the old house rules from the Chronicle system and adapt them so that the players are assumed to all be part of the same community. And a lot of gameplay involves either uh, protecting uh, and fortifying your calm or going out and you know uh, uh, helping to build it up, establishing resources, finding new benefits and alliances and things like that for uh, for them. And um, yeah, so keep an eye out. Uh, keep an eye out for at uh, uh, greenrunning.com, and we'll be having lots of more information on that in the future. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so I think that's all we've got. Uh, if anyone's got questions, we've got about ten minutes. I'm sorry, I have to darn it. Oh. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, no questions for you, Joe. No questions. Yeah, no for questions you. for Joe. Somebody take notes. <laughs> you also can't have the cookies I brought. Um, oh damn. Was there anything coming more coming for fans? Oh yes. Um, the uh, the book after Campaign Builder's Guide is called Layers. Um, so it's, it's essentially like it's kind of like the BT area Part Two, uh, but. Um, you know, instead of just being like, here's a monster, um, it's uh, it's a series of, of pre-built layers with adventure hooks and treasure and you know all this stuff. So basically, a lot of like pre-built encounters um, that you can uh, can drop into your game. Um, that is heading into production soon, um, and then after that, um, there is a setting, um, an original. Uh, campaign setting for Fantasy Age uh, that we've been working on. Um, that'll come out next year. Um, that'll be the next big thing for Fantasy Age. Uh, yeah. That's what we have to say about that. <laughs> yes, um, do you have, as one of the South that currently kind of have any true company or noble house rules for the A system? There is a, there's organization rules. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are organization rules, and they can be adapted to that in age. Um, they vary a little bit between age games. Um, um, Lazarus have, has rules for running your own organization in the modern day. Yeah. I want to say the modern age companion. The modern age companion has the one thing we added were organizational positions in the companion um, that are linked to the specific channels of influence that your organization has. Right, so you can be the uh, social aspect character in the organization or the military character uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, you know those are also present in the Fantasy Age Companion. Um, and yeah, Blue Rose. Blue Rose, yeah. Any other questions? There, I, I, I'm not expecting it. I just thought, uh, is there any chance of any War Dragon Age? Ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I, I used the fantasy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the spirit is willing. <laughs> I know. I just was wondering if it was even you guys ever contemplated. Um, well, so basically, uh, at the current answer is no. Um, we uh, we can continue to sell the Dragon Age stuff that we produced, um, but we can't make new books for it. Um, but you know, things can change. Because essentially what happened after Inquisition is that is that the Dragon Age team at Bioware shrunk down massively. Um, and uh, and you know they've been sort of slowly gestating a new game. So, you know, right now they don't really have the staff power to be dealing with, you know, like uh, doing approvals on gigantic role playing books. But who knows? <laughs> you know, when they spin up the next game, uh, might, something might be possible. Anyone else? Yes. Was Was there any further intent since you had already done a licensed mutant and mastermind product with DC to look at other licensed superhero to do under M and M rules? Um, that is possible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the DC 
think, uh, DC Adventures was great, um, but was limited um, because you know DC is a giant company. Well, one, it's owned by Warner Brothers now. You know, essentially, when we went to negotiate for that license, and we wanted a more traditional, like open-ended license, like we have with the Expanse, where we can continue to produce supplements for years. When we tried to negotiate that, um, DC was like, "Well, we want an advance of a hundred thousand dollars." So, for a company like us, we don't really have that line. Um, so, <laughs> so we were like, "Okay, what if we just did four books?" They were like, "Oh, well, then the advance would be this much smaller amount." We were like, "Okay, let's do that." So, that's why the whole plan for DC Adventures was from the get-go: four books, rule book, two character books, and a universe book, and then you know, uh, that was it. So, uh, you know. Uh, there have been other Marvel games. Um, Marvel can be a difficult license holder. <laughs> uh, there are other heroic lines. There are, <laughs> yes. So, anyway, but yes. There, there are possible. heroes who come on a half shell. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh that was slick. Thank you, thank you. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, a, that's the. Uh, so, the so Mass Friends tradition has been around for a while. Do you have yeah. plans on the fourth edition, or are you happy with the third edition? Uh, at the moment, we are powering forward with third. You know, we, we have you know, vaguely discussed what would we do with fourth, but it's not a thing currently. It, it's more a list of like what could we do better than it is yeah. like an outline of a document. Could you imagine it being more like second and third person, mostly tweets and, and things? Yeah, it would not be radical because you know essentially because third edition has been published for so long now, um, you know we have a nice robust bunch of support for it. So if we did like a radical re-envisioning, it'd be like, okay, well forget all those books. <laughs> now let's start from scratch. Uh, which we yes, thank you, Shadowrunner. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. Ouch. Never speak to me or my Shadow Runners again. <laughs> uh, and I just want to beat the drum yeah. for Freeport Age. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's definitely possible. <laughs> so yeah, we're so uh, you don't get hired at the company if you're not a fan of Freeport. <laughs> um, next year, in addition to being the company's 20th anniversary, is also Freeport's 20th anniversary because uh, the first Freeport book, Death in Freeport, came out at Gen Con 2000. Um, so we'll be doing something for Freeport next year. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, and, uh, you know. Taking our signature fantasy setting and our signature fantasy role-playing game, I mean, it's not crazy. So. Anyone else? All right. One, 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 one. Do you have any other systems? Or are you pretty happy with the Chronicle, these masterminds, and... Uh, and, and orc. And, and orc. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Y'all. Uh, nothing in the near future, but um, you know we're not close to it either. So, you know, it's, age is nice because it's proved very flexible and adaptable to other genres and things. And you know there is a power in um, in learning one rule system. And even though each age game, you know, is unique in some ways, you know, the core of it is the same. And so if you play Dragon Age, it's very easy to pick up Modern Age. I use Blue Rose and Fancy Age, all that stuff for Dragon Age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know for, um... You should incorporate some expanse in there. <laughs> for enemies and allies, we're, one of the things that's included are uh, how to convert uh, stuff from Fantasy Age um, back and forth. Uh, which is one of the one of the reasons, for example, in the fantasy section, I tried to specifically avoid crossing over with Fantasy Age. So um, there are a lot of classic fantasy monsters in the Fantasy Age be scary, or in Fantasy Age Four that I don't won't necessarily give a treatment in Modern Age because because it's there and the treatment yeah. there is good. And we can you can use it. So, however, if you want the headless horseman uh -huh. uh, in Fantasy Age, um, you know you can convert it the other way because the headless horseman. Is sort of one of the one of the big bad in the uh, in the modern fantasy section in Enemies and Allies. All right. Thanks very much. We'll be here all. <laughs> <laughs> we have been here all. Day. <laughs>